evening. I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, the Army's premier research facility on the history and heritage of the Army and its soldiers. Tonight, we're very pleased to have Dr. John, Dr. John McLevick, who joined the faculty of the National Defense University Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk, Virginia in August 2020. He serves as chair of the theory and history field of study at the Joint Advanced Warfare School. He previously worked as a professor of military history at the United States Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth in the Department of Military History, as well as the satellite campus at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Prior to assuming that position, Dr. McLevich was a historian for the United States Army Center of Military History at Fort McNair, Washington, DC, working in the Contemporary Studies branch. He has taught college courses since 2003 at James Madison University, Tallahassee Community College, the Florida State University, as well as America Military University. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Longwood College in Farmville, Virginia, and a master's degree in United States history from James Madison University. He earned his doctorate degree in United States history, Islamic world, and the military history of the uh, history from the Florida State University. He has published numerous articles, reviews, and other scholarly works, and is the author of Blood, Guts, and Grease, George S. Patton in World War I, which is the topic of tonight's talk. So the Florida State University is like the Ohio State University. We got to emphasize the the. Um, I'm trying to make that a thing, so yes. Make that a thing too? Well, welcome. I'm glad that uh, you could join us. Uh, we look forward to hearing uh, about a rather famous individual in, in our nation's history and our Army's history. So John, the floor is yours. All right, Mike, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, again, I'm uh, John Michael Shack from uh, the Joint Advanced Warfighting School, <clears throat> which is located at uh, Joint Forces Staff College down in Norfolk, Virginia, um, and what JAWS is, because it's, it's a relatively new war college uh, compared to some. Um, it's a joint planners war college. So uh, the students that graduate when they graduate the their follow-on assignment is usually tied to a combatant command uh, assignment where they are a planner um, and so I see a couple students showed up for this so they'll they'll be rewarded some way somehow um, but uh, before I get going with the book um, I'll what I do is I talk about kind of how the uh, the book came to be developed um, and it kind of started all the way back when I was an undergrad at Longwood College, now Longwood University. <clears throat> I was a uh, history major, senior, and I was selected as a Marshall Scholar. And part of the job was you had to write a paper using primary documents, all that stuff. <clears throat> and it was uh, kind of centered around VMI. Uh, and when I went to the library for the first time, right in front, and I'd have been a couple of years, but the, in the walkway was the Academy Award of the movie Patton. Um, and it was around that time, my uncle who wrote the forward uh, for Blood, Guts and Grease, P.T. Michael Sheck, uh, had taken command of 3rd U.S. Army. <clears throat> so, you know, I was a good history student. I put two and two together. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Patton, now my uncle. Um, and wrote my paper on Patton and the slapping incidents and kind of the public reaction. And uh, from then on, wrote my master's thesis on uh, another patent-related topic. And then a dissertation was on Mark Wayne Clark, the U.S. Fifth Army in Italy. And it was in that time between roughly 2002, when I was an undergrad, um, that I met Martin Blumenson, who I always like to mention. Um, he's one of the great World War II historians, uh, wrote some of the official histories of World War II at the U.S. Army Center of Military History, um, arguably some of the more readable ones too, and his focus was on the Italian theater. And I got to know him pretty well, and he lived in Northwest D.C. right by the zoo, and I started going up to his uh, apartment uh, about twice a month, and we would get together and talk history. He gave me some good ideas. <clears throat> As I got to know him better, um, he, he liked drinking gimlets, so we drank a lot of gimlets, gin gimlets, too. That was very important. Um, and that, it was ultimately through him, and what Blumenson is probably most well-known for was he edited Patton's collected writings into the Patton papers, which were New York Times bestsellers. 
Um, and this was kind of to right after the movie had come out in 1970. Um, and Blumenson had made a kind of career writing about topics, a lot on World War II, mainly Italy. Uh, my, my dissertation topic came from him, just talking, hanging out, and um, talking about, you know, history, drinking gimlets. And <clears throat> when I got, I started this book, let me see, 2017. Um, and I wanted, you know, the movies, Marvel movies were big. Origin stories were always big. And so what I wanted to kind of get at was the origin of this figure. And when we have a memory of George Patton, we kind of all have an image of this guy. Um, I couldn't get a giant U.S. flag as my background. So, but if you, when a, most Americans think of George S. Patton, this is kind of what they think of. And that's, you know, George C. Scott in front of the American flag, uh, giving a, a, a talk. and this image kind of is perfect because if you look at Patton throughout his life, uh, this is what he really wanted to be. He would have been real thrilled with George C. Scott uh, representation. He also would have liked the fact that George C. Scott had a kind of deeper gravelly voice uh, than George Patton did in reality. Patton had this kind of high squeaky voice uh, that I won't really try to imitate, <clears throat> but it was one of his when, uh, and he even wrote about it, he didn't like how he sounded. He put look the part, but didn't kind of sound. And when you see George C. Scott, he's got that that voice, um, and it's not quite Patton esque. He, he did too good of a job. Um, then <clears throat> other images of Patton is this World War II Patton, and this is when we think of George Patton. He kind of just emerged onto the world stage in 1942, 43, and this old gruff looking figure. What I was thinking about years ago, talking to Martin Blumenson, talking with my uncle, was we don't really know much about this guy. Um, this is Patton before he kind of took on that facade of what he wanted to be. And so that's kind of where the book idea came from, was to find out where Patton became the Patton we all kind of know, uh, some historians like, but we should all kind of appreciate um, and when I started looking into, you know, research on Patton, <clears throat> you, you saw a lot of themes that Patton is famous for, the, the vulgar language, the real fiery speeches, attention to detail, the spit clean image. All of that really emerges in this war, in World War I. Um, and it's, it's kind of where I started going with the book, where it kind of took off. Um, and I thought, you know, this is, I was teaching ILE at the time, um, which, you know, a lot of the students were senior captains, uh, early field grade officers. So it kind of worked well with that, with what I was dealing with, uh, because Patton will go from a first lieutenant when he leaves for France as a first lieutenant, and he comes back a Colonel 06. Uh, he has a pretty good rate of advancement, not quite as quick as he would have liked to be. Um, but that's really where the idea was. And the, the kind of the theme of the book, the thesis, was that it's World War I was the foundational event for Patton. It's where he learned uh, a lot of the traits that became a leader. Um, it was his first time on a major staff, uh, his first time in combat, real combat, as we'll talk about in Mexico. Uh, his first time as a trainer. First time as a commander, um, and he held a lot of additional duties. And when you look at his writings, and this is a guy that wrote every day, multiple letters. Um, and I'll get into his letters with uh, his wife because that story kind of took on a life of its own more than I intended it to be. Um, but you see, it was really this foundation right here, World War One, and the influence of John Pershing. Um, and that's, these two are very much related, interrelated. They almost were related uh, by marriage. Uh, Patton's sister, Nita Patton, will date John Pershing on and off. Um, they were engaged at one point. Well, they'll quite never marry, uh, get together uh, as the war gets in the way, other things. Um, but when I was going through the research, it became very clear that 
prior to 1916, which is when Patton links up with Pershing for the first time, uh, has the first you know experience around kind of the marquee army officer, one of the marquee leaders. Um, he really appreciated how Pershing ran, not just a staff, but how he just carried himself, how he did everything. This was a guy he molded himself after. Um, and you see Patton transform from, you know, a, a new, you know, fairly recent graduate, the U.S. Uh, Army uh, Military Academy down at West Point. He was at VMI for a year, uh, which was Patton's kind of ancestral home uh, before his family moved to California. Um, but it's when he meets Pershing, he kind of finds his, his role model. And the rest of his career, he will go trying to be John Pershing. He will quite carry it off in a different way. Um, and the two will be very close up until really uh, the slapping incidents in, in Italy, in Sicily, when uh, Pershing by that point is uh, at Walter Reed. He pretty much spends the last years of his life in Walter Reed, um, still never married, uh, still kind of pining over what could have been with Pat and sister. Um, but when he hears the press about Patton slapping the soldiers in the mil in the hospital, they kind of have a falling out. And as far as I could tell, I never really got confirmation, could see it. The uh, After the slapping incidents, they never met. Um, and Pershing will actually outlive Patton by just a bit. Is, um, he'll die right kind of after the war. Um, but it's Mexico is where I started the book. And that was where that was a, a decision. Uh, originally, it was just going to be like World War One, but it's the link to Pershing that I kind of was like, we have to talk about this. Also, what you find was Patton, his when he makes this decision later and when the war kicks off to join the tank corps, um, it's based on a lot of what he did in Mexico because um, it's in Mexico uh, where Patton participates in the first motorized infantry attack in U.S. military history. Uh, Patton will write a letter to his father. Um, and again, Patton was very easy as a, as a historian, is fun to research. He's easy to research. You can just go to the Library, Archi Library of Archives, uh, National Archives in College Park, and all his writings basically from the time he was six to almost within the last couple days of his life, he wrote a lot to his wife, um, a lot to his father. Uh, he also includes uh, Pershing, other relatives, and a lot of army officers who will become rather well known in World War II. Um, but when I decided to start with the book in Mexico, it kind of made sense. Uh, because one of the justification Patton gives to himself and the army to join the tank corps is he was in this first motorized infantry attack. Um, and he wrote to his dad uh, immediately after the event in, on April 5th, 15th, 1916. Um, and Patton, if, if you've ever read his papers, some of them are being digitized as well. Uh, it's a little easier to access. His original handwriting is really hard to read. Uh, mainly, he's really writing quick, particularly in the war. Uh, you can tell there were times he's tired. And what happened after the war, after he died, when uh, Martin Blumenson began working on it, uh, it was one of uh, Patton's relatives kind of typed everything out. And so you can kind of work with both of them and kind of see what works. Uh, but he wrote to his father, um, and he did have a lot of misspelling, so sometimes he is hard to read. Martin Blumenson theorized he was, um, he had a learning disability, dyslexia, uh, was never, never, you know, they did not have any documentation for it. And I don't, I don't know if Blumenson's wrong, but I think it chalked it up to his spelling grammar issues was he, uh, had a real oral history background. That's how he kind of was educated, how he learned to read. And I think he sounded some words out and that's kind of where it came from. It wasn't dyslexia, which Patton himself would kind of make jokes about it. Um, but other than that, he writes pretty well as I will you know, discover too later on in the war. Uh, but in this raid, what happens is, you know, they're trying to find Pancho Villa uh, and Patton just went out to get some corn for the soldiers. 
Uh, Pershing is in command. Patton has no real role. He's kind of just like a random officer that uh, due to his connections with uh, Pershing and the relationship with Patton's sister, um, the fact that Patton was arguably the wealthiest army officer in the entire army, uh, he was able to kind of get into some jobs that probably others couldn't get into, uh, which will play a part in kind of how he's remembered and how the movie, the Pat Patton, uh, plays out. And when in this attack in April 16th, uh, he is dr within a driving a Jeep and he finds out, lo and behold, in this town, uh, it's one of Pancho Villa's chief lieutenants. And, uh, and this is too, you'll see this Patton when he, there's not a lot of thought he just reacts he just goes um so him and a few of the soldiers basically uh go into the little village uh using the vehicle which Patton will write about how fast he was driving it was all all very cool very fast and furious um and then he says i got about 20 yards from the gate and i saw three uh mexicans rot rode out i did not shout uh they started to run away and they met my men and turned back, all firing at me at about 20 yards or less. I fired back five times with my new pistol, and one of them ducked back into the house. I found later that one was the insurgent he had shot, and I hit them both and his horse. And uh, once the fighting dies down, Patton will actually tie the body to the hood of his car, of Jeep. And when they're getting ready to kind of go back to headquarters, they notice in the distance that there's a big, you know, cloud of dust kicking up and Patton, and again, he, he's thinking there was about 40 men galloping towards them. Um, and so just think about how history could have been if Patton uh, couldn't get that Jeep to turn over. Um, and he rides back to the headquarter. And, and again, it's kind of, when we think of Patton, none of this should surprise you. He presents Pershing with the body. Um, and pa uh, Pershing will nickname him, the uh, nickname Patton the Bandit, which will be a lifelong nickname. Um, and uh, Patton will be grateful for Pershing. Pershing kind of just is like, okay, Georgie, that, cool. Uh, get rid of the body. And he allowed uh, Patton to keep uh, some of the gear uh, that the, the had claimed, uh, which Patton would keep. <clears throat> um, and it was here. In Mexico, uh, Patton first got, you know, taste of combat, not like he's going to see in World War I. Uh, but it's here, Pershing too grows to appreciate Patton, not only for kind of his quirkiness, but also he's a pretty effective junior officer. He gets things done. Um, and that will be very important. Um, but when, and this was where uh, my uncle would tease me, he would tell me the first half of the book is a soap opera. And then the half, the second half is where the war gets starting. Uh, what, and I think is a you know good historian. I had to talk about the role um, of his of his wife, and she plays a really important role in his wife in his life. And there you see a picture of her on the wedding day, Beatrice Ayer Patton. Um, she is a pretty influential figure in many ways. Uh, but she came from a very wealthy New England family. Um, and there are some, if you want to be a little bit cynical, Patton kind of was looking for that because he had visions and dreams of high command. And he knew that in army life, uh, particularly in this era, the army officers didn't make a lot of money. They didn't live in, you know, nice places, uh, particularly in, in the early part of his career. They're still out west, pretty rural, remote outposts. Um, and they tend to, they meet at West Point, they tend, they start dating. Um, and it's when they get married, she plays a really important role, um, not only for the financial aspect, which there are some moments in World War I uh, that her wealth allows Patton a lot of access um, and a lot of, uh, they, he buys Pershing a car, um, just strokes a check for about, uh, what was it, $4,200. Uh, for a uh, Packard, um, which today's money, it's about $100,000 that he just cuts a check for. Uh, and he basically allows Pershing to, to ride around in it. And the main reason is <clears throat> Pershing is the, the head of the U.S. Army, the military there. He needs to ride in style. 
Um, and if you think about that, how many army officers, you know, can just go around Paris in the middle of war, just buying a new car. Uh, and Patton would write to his wife the next day um, and say, like, hey, could you just put a little bit more money in my uh, checking account this week? Um, but that's what he did. Uh, where I also think Beatrice Ayer Patton um, good was uh, you see it even before he's at, at West Point. Patton tends to be very energetic, um, very emotional, uh, tends to be hot and cold. Um, he'll be really high up there, and then he can come crashing down. She leveled him out pretty well. Um, and they will stay married together the, for the rest of Patton's life. Um, and he will write to her sometimes five times a day during World War I. And so the first half of the book, almost the first half, ends up being a lot on their relationship. Um, and it's kind of, that was never my intent, <clears throat> but it just kind of took on a life of its own. Um, and he will spend a lot of the first year in England and then France trying to get her overseas. Uh, they'll try a, a bunch of tactics, uh, but Patton will refuse. He just doesn't want her coming over as a nurse. Um, and they will have three kids together. <clears throat> um, and then his son will be, uh, become a major general, two-star uh, general later on in life. Um, and two daughters as well, and Beatrice and Little B, uh, who will write about Patton kind of later in life. Uh, but Patton's wife, I thought, really important for him. And he would not have probably achieved what he did without her support. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot there. Now, uh, what's going to happen when World War I breaks out? Per uh, Pershing and Patton are still in Mexico. They are watching pretty much as much news as they can get. Um, and what they're, they're beginning to kind of plan to what we will, what should we do if the U.S. gets into war? Uh, if Patton had his way, he would have joined the war in 1914. In fact, he tries to, he even thinks about uh, leaving the U.S. Army, going is, you know, elsewhere thinking about joining the reserves. <clears throat> uh, but when the U.S. does get involved in April 1917, um, because of his relationship and prior service in Mexico, he's going to be hot on Pershing staff. Again, he has no real defined role. He's technically a first lieutenant. He will be promoted to uh, captain. Um, but even Patton wrote in June 1917, uh, he was writing about what his job was, and this is what he wrote. He said, I'm sort of a poobah and do everything no one else does. The chief difficulty comes in making seven cars do the work at 20. Uh, so he's kind of this random junior officer, staff officer, um, and he is uh, aboard the Baltic, the one of the, the ship that takes kind of the core of what becomes the United States Army uh, over in World War I. They ship out uh, May 28th, 1917. And it's that Baltic group that they nickname themselves the Baltic Society. They will have anniversaries every year uh, following this. Um, when Pershing and Patton then set up shop, they first go to England. There's some comical stories in the book uh, about Patton and dealing with the English and then the French. <clears throat> um, but as the war begins to, you know, kids keep it keeps going. Uh, he is in this staff officer he begin, role. He begins to get real upset that, you know, these, he sees all these reservists coming in as like 03's captains and are pinning on 06 within a, in three months. And he is regular army. Uh, he's kind of getting dissatisfied. Um, and Patton, who had wrote even since he was a child about being in combat, finding, you know, this, this great role for him, being a great commander. Uh, he begins to kind of think about getting out of Pershing's shadow. Um, and there's some risk to this because he is one of the top aides to the number one uh, American overseas. Uh, but Patton also, too, personally knows that and he wants to kind of be his own man. Uh, he will go back and forth uh, basically by the end of summer to early fall 1917 about what to do. And this is, again, because of his relationship with Pershing, he has a lot of choices. Pershing will take care of him. 
Um, Patton is a cavalry man by training. Um, he thinks about going to infantry because that's the quickest way to uh, take command. Uh, then cavalry, he's you know, there's just not a lot of roles for him. <clears throat> and then he starts hearing about these tanks. Um, and the U.S. is going to begin to create this U.S. tank corps, uh, which you see this uh, photo, which is the cover of one of the earlier works on uh, U.S. tanks in World War I, Dale Wilson's book, who it's, it's another great book to read. Um, and this poster, just, it's, it's cool. It's got everything there. Uh, but Patton is kind of skeptical of tanks, not sure what to think of it. Um, and he writes in September and October. Uh, he goes back and forth depending on which day you ask him. And he says, the tanks are yet in an unsettled state, but they may have a great future. Um, and by November, uh, he is beginning to have trouble sleeping. And then he writes on November 3rd, I didn't sleep a bit and decided to try the tanks as it, aspire, it might be the quickest way to high command if I make a go of it. And then he does write, and this was again Patton, who was famous for kind of, he, he has these visions, these dreams, uh, believes in reincarnation, which again, I think is tied to this oral history. He, he read all, he listened, talked about all this oral history, sees things. I don't think he could connect the dots where he heard it from. So that's where he gets his idea of reincarnation from. But this was what he wrote to his father. And he tended to write more of his like dreams, what his big aspirations were to his father. Uh, and he writes on November 6, 1917, here's the golden dream. First, I will run the tank school. Then they will organize the battalion and I will command it. Three, I will make it, make it good. And if the tanks do well, the war lasts, I'll get the first regiment. Then step four, if the same if as before, they'll make me a brigade and I'll get the star. And then he adds, the tank will be a great drawing cards in the papers and illustrated magazines. The casualties in the tanks are about 25%, but only about 7.5% lower than the Doughboys. Um, and that's what he tells his father is kind of what pushed him to make this decision to join the tanks. Um, and if you look at his list, which is to run the school, he will do that. He will run the first uh, U.S. Army light tank school. He then will take the first command, the battalion command, will be the first brigade commander. Um, the only thing he will not achieve, which he will write very bitterly about, is he will not get that one star. Uh, he's going to have to wait until the late 30s to pin on as his first star. Um, he also does write in other parts uh, that he wants to uh, win a lot of medals, uh, particularly the Medal of Honor, which is we'll talk about one of the kind of dark sides or kind of where his ego gets the best of them. <clears throat> um, and so Patton is officially allowed to join the tank corps. Uh, one of the reasons he gets that command, it's not just he knew Pershing. It was also, he writes in his application letter, he's like, I have worked with cars because of Patton's wealth. He had a lot of automobiles. He actually did work with them a lot. So he had the mechanical side down about as well as anyone could in 1917. But he also talks about his in motorized infantry attack in 1916 in Mexico. Um, and so you put all that things together, Patton kind of is, makes, it's the right choice really in a lot of ways. Um, and so when Patton joins the tank corps, his first assignment, um, and this is what I thought I think stands out in the book too, is that he's a captain. He's about to make major here because uh, the war promotions, he is beginning to get promoted. Uh, they, he doesn't have a lot of oversight. This is a, a fairly young officer, um, and he is told, all right, go find a tank for the U.S. Army to use. Um, and, and what he does, he will tour France, tour a bunch of tank factories. Uh, and Patton, um, again, because of his wealth, he had traveled to France before. His wife went to school in France, so she was fluent. Patton is pretty near fluent in French at this time. He is a Francophile, loves anything France, anything French. Um, now, he too is a little more uh, favors in World War I, tanks were divided in a real complex way. You had heavy tanks, medium tanks, light tanks. That's it. Um, the medium tanks are not that useful in World War I. The heavy tanks are what the British use 
a lot of the mark tanks, which you kind of see here in this uh, poster. Patton liked the lighter tanks for another reason, and he'll, that's why they go with the French Renault light tank. Partially it is because it's French, so that's that sells them. Um, but it is a little more reliable and better on the attack. Um, and the, these mark tanks were meant to get over no man's land. While the Renault tanks could be used, they're two-man crews used to take down machine gun nests, uh, things like that. A little more reliable, uh, which will become a problem uh, for tanks that still continues to this day. <clears throat> um, and so by December 1917, Patton, again, is a relatively junior officer, goes with the French Renault tank for the U.S. light tank. Um, and he will write what he calls the tank report. Um, and really, Patton, you can see where he went through some of his notes later on in life. Uh, he wrote a note on the side, kind of like on the margins. Um, and he wrote, uh, in my opinion, this is the basic tank concept of the United States Army. Very important. Um, and he wrote later to his wife that there was no man in the U.S. Army that could combine his mechanical knowledge with his general tactical and organizational knowledge. And he was quite proud of the report. And when you read the report, uh, it's really remarkable. Um, the, his attention to detail, his mastery of really the mechanics behind everything. And uh, when he took his time, Patton was a, a really good writer. Um, and I think that's one thing people, when you think of Patton, they don't think of that. Uh, but he, he was not an academic like some of the other tank theorists will become. Uh, but he wrote a very clear, succinct tank report, um, and he was proud of it. And when you read it, it really is, it's remarkable. Um, and I do think that's a, not, it's, Patton was really the right guy for this job. Also, I don't know how many other Americans could have done what he did. Um, he then will also pick um, the training center. Um, in France, uh, and that go he goes as far as he like he does the layout of the actual camp, um, and that's when he sets up the first light tank school in France. And here you see a couple images. These are all mainly um, from uh, National Archives two in College Park. Some of them in Library of Congress, and. Uh, you see in the background, and you'll see again in a minute here, th those are those Renault tanks, these little two-man tanks. Um, they were weighed about seven and a quarter tons, four-cylinder engine, and on a really good day, could go about five miles an hour. Um, Patton, uh, when he sends his report to the U.S., uh, the U.S. manufacturers will never produce an American Renault tank that uh, gets to France by the war. They all show up a couple days after. Um, and the, um, he, Patton had to kind of increase the size of the room malt. Everything was about two inches too lower. So he raised everything up. Um, and there's still some around. They have them at the Patton Museum as well. Um, and the, the Pat the Renault tanks are, they end up serving, uh, a pretty good role. I, I, uh, despite some of my, my, my fellow historian friends, I don't make any claims that the tanks were decisive in winning the war. It played a part. That is it. In these tanks, the creation of, uh, you know, the tank core, what will be used in World War II. Uh, but when Patton, now this is early 1918 to spring 1918, begins to build the tank school, this is where you see where Patton maybe needed a little bit more work, uh, was not quite the bureaucratic organizational leader that Pershing will be. Uh, he will begin to get in arguments with locals over the delays in getting the agreements for the land. Uh, he will begin to get in disagreements with higher headquarters uh, about soldiers not coming, getting the wrong soldiers. Um, and Patton will write, um, getting a hell of a reputation for being a skunk when officers don't salute me. I make them stop and do it. I also reported a reserve lieutenant today for profanity. I expect some of them would like to poison me. Um, and you begin to see a theme here that will develop. You see it in shades in the interwar period, but in World War II as well. Um, he is very hard on soldiers and officers that don't act professionally, don't look professionally, attention to detail, the salutes. 
Um, the washing tanks became a big thing. Um, and he will begin to use profanity in a lot of his talks, which to some extent will endear him to a lot of his soldiers. Uh, some, particularly more of the religious side, will never get, never accept. Um, and Patton generally, based on what I could find, the, I did find letters from soldiers that were written while they were there and then years after they served with Patton. Uh, the letters I found, again, which shouldn't be that coincidence, they kept them for a reason. They tended to enjoy Patton's speeches. Um, they they d were realized he was a hard uh, boss to work for. Um, and Patton, you know, he knew he, he was rough with some of them. Uh, but he did write, he goes the, to his wife, I think they like me. They even wrote a song about me, what is fairly complimentary. And when they follow and they sit, keep telling me, they'll follow me through the, to the other side. I don't see why they like me as I curse them freely on all occasions. But the drafted man is just like the regular, which is a surprise to me. And you kind of see this patent that be, gets this notoriety um, as you see in North Africa and then Sicily, um, it wasn't for everyone, but it was effective and it was getting people in. And he becomes too, this is his first real attempt at training administration. Um, and he does a good job. Um, the, the school begins to produce and they start to build. He starts to uh, get, you know, more company. I'm looking to see some of these questions in the chat box. Uh, yeah, Patton did write to his father about killing fat colonels on site, um, and that was really to everybody. And I think that if Patton were around today in 2022, he'd probably still say the same thing. Um, so there you go. Here's, uh, again, the Renault tank, um, which becomes the, the basis of the U.S. light tank school and the light tank corps. Um, the first Patton gets his hands on the first tanks on Mar in March 1918. Um, and again, this shows again how they're starting from nothing. He, Patton, when he gets the report, hey, the, the tanks, have, they've all been railed in. Uh, Patton is the, realizes he's the only one that knows how to drive. Um, and so he unloads every tank by himself. Um, and when Patton begins to drop them off and they begin to train, uh, it's, it's a very... It's not an overly intense schedule. It's kind of like a PME schedule, to be honest. It's they get up, have PT in the morning. Maybe I don't think they played ultimate frisbee then, but maybe they did. Do a little workout, breakfast. Then they report by eight or nine. Then they did training, segmented times, uh, lunch, and they were done. You know, by mid afternoon. Um, it, it's what, which to me was a little surprising when you see. All the, you know, all the, the competitive who -ness that goes on in the Army uh, and DOD. Um, and this image, too, here, you, you see this figure on the right, um, I think is an important figure to Patton. And again, he's kind of another figure uh, lost to kind of the history books because, uh, you know, he never became a president, never had a cool movie made after him. <clears throat> but you get uh, Samuel Rockenback, who becomes the chief of the U.S. tank corps. Um, and Rockenback, Patton and him will never see eye to eye. Rockenback will always praise Patton publicly. Um, oh, even privately, he wrote very well of Patton. Um, and Rockenback uh, will retire as a one star, uh, which is a one star position. <clears throat> um, Patton will never quite appreciate Rockenback. Uh, and that's mainly, you'll see too, a trend with Patton. He's always having issues with his superiors, always. Um, it's either they're, they're lazy, they're dumb, they're not aggressive. He viewed Rockenback as kind of this old school dude that kind of outlived his usefulness, didn't know uh, what he was doing. Uh, but Rockenback, what I found, Rockenback's papers are at VMI as well. Um, he did a lot of administrative organizational work and kept superiors off pack, which Patton did not realize that, and I don't think he really ever did his entire life, realized how important that was. Um, that, that, because as you see, there are moments when Patton has a little bit more paperwork, organizational, higher ups are coming to visit. He does not do that well with that. Um, he he kind of gets grumpy, takes it out on soldiers. Um, and, you know, you can see it in his letters to his wife, particularly. He, he just 
Rockenbach does a great job of being, a, you know, screening out a lot of that noise and Patton can just focus on the war. Um, and what is happening by spring, summer, 1918, uh, Patton is beginning to be worried. He's like, I need to use, I need to show the world what these tanks do. He's also concerned because if I don't get in this war, I'm not going to get promoted. I'm not going to get all these medals. Um, and he wants to do it. Then what will happen, he will make his first uh, appearance on the front. Uh, he goes out uh, with uh, some French and American soldiers to kind of survey uh, the front lines. This is in preparation of them beginning to see where the tanks can fight. Uh, they don't have any orders yet. Uh, and what you'll see too, this is again a very, when you think of Patton, this shouldn't be that surprising. Uh, he gets within about 100 yards of where the firing line for the Germans is ending. <clears throat> he actually picks up some shrapnel um, and he sees Germans in the distance. And so what does Patton do? He's kind of right on the fringe of no man's land, uh, Patton lights up a cigarette and just stands there. Um, and Patton will write, you know, he was, you know, he, he was scared, uh, but he didn't want to let anyone see it. Um, and Patton will write about this a lot, about how, and they kind of hint at it in the movie, uh, when he's in North Africa and the planes attack, he kind of jumps out the window and fires his pistol. It's, it's real hoo stuff, but he wanted to look at the enemy and have them shoot at him in front of his nose. That was what he would say a lot. Um, but it, this was, again, you see Patton wanted to get into the fight. Um, and what will happen is by the end of summer, um, he now has two battalions, the 327th Light Tank Battalion, 326th. Um, and they will merge into the 304th Tank Brigade, which will be reflagged, the 1st Tank Brigade. And what will happen is by August into September, they will begin to get ready uh, for their first, uh, you know, action in the war. Um, and this is the, his baptism by fire. Um, and you can see what happens by August. Patton has really ramped up his planning. He has the right commanders in charge, the right company commanders in charge, um, and his his real his chief lieutenant Sereno Brett, who you saw in that lineup, he was one of the figures. Who Sereno Brett uh, is really the 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 spiritual leader of the U.S. Tank Corps, um, and he's a figure too that no one kind of. He doesn't go on to become a general. Um, he goes on and ha has to retire in the middle of World War II, retires as a colonel. Um, he will, Sereno Brett will never leave the tank corps, unlike he's one of the only ones that will stay. Um, and Brett, uh, Patton will write glowing things about him for his entire life. Um, and Brett will serve on some staffs in the early years of World War II, uh, but retire. But Brett is another figure. Um, he does have some papers that, you know, that there's a further story there. Um, one of these really important figures that we've kind of forgotten about. Um, so when Patton gets his brigade ready, which consists of two companies or two battalions, uh, six companies all together, and, that and they had a repair and salvage company, which were their mechanics. Uh, they received their orders to reduce, to help reduce the salient at St. Mayhill on this map. Um, and that order is given to them on 3 September 1918. Um, and they will, they're going to work under the 1st Army right in between the 4th, 5th Corps boundary. <clears throat> um, as we, some of you know, um, that this operation, uh, if you saw the movie 1917, uh, it, it's kind of similar to that in many ways. The Germans are beginning to retreat uh, to their defense in depth. Uh, for this final uh, final offensive. And so when the U.S. In, uh, starts to roll into no man's land, the Germans are actually retreating. Uh, not to say there's no combat there is, but this is not the heavy fighting the Americans expected. Um, and Patton is real right. He's kind of disappointed about it. Uh, but the operation succeeds. Um, and for his tank brigade, uh, the, the casualties are out of... Um, uh, they have 
about 80 tanks, 25 French tanks, which Patton did have a uh, French uh, element in his unit. Uh, two tanks were destroyed by direct hit. Three tanks came down with tr engine trouble. And 40 tanks were ditched for random mechanical issues or ran running out of gas, which would become a real problem. <clears throat> and altogether, his brigade, uh, four killed in action, four wounded. Um, and there is an interesting story um, in the book where Patton and then Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur meet at the top of a hill and they have kind of like this standoff in the middle of a firefight about who's, you know, it's a measuring contest. And they both will refuse to uh, back down. So they just stand there like idiots. Um, luckily for the U.S., they, you know, if you think about it, a well-placed shell would have had a pretty massive effect on World War II. Um, but when Patton uh, gets back to uh, the training, uh, his camp, um, he, he's genuinely happy with it, not thrilled. Um, and he writes to his wife, sometimes I think I'm not a great commander after all. I'm just a fighting animal. But still, I'll improve. And in time, at least, if one learns by mistakes, I ought to be wise. I've made all there is. Um, <clears throat> so overall, Patton is, he is happy with the way they worked, the other units are, um, but the kind of left him wanting a little bit more. Um, and he'll get his chance in one of the largest operations in American history, which is the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, uh, which takes place basically within a couple weeks after uh, the first operation. <clears throat> they get their orders at the end of September. Uh, Patton's brigade is to operate within the first core boundary near the Meuse River. And he takes into action about 140 tanks. Uh, so he's got a little bit more firepower. And Patton begins the move out with his tanks on 26 September 1918 at 0600. Um, and what the way these tanks moved, they had to, it was best if they were railed in and then had a short road march to the front line just because the, all the mechanical issues, all the gas. Um, and the way tanks were, com were commanded in this time, um, you had two in a tank, in a Renault, and the officers led them on foot. Uh, so when we say think of Patton leading by the front, he does. Um, and he will write, and his soldiers will remember uh, all his speeches about saying, the goal of a U.S. tank officer is to die. Um, and their tank, their tank officers will have a really high casualty rate because they're walking fairly slowly into no man's land and they're just walking about 100 feet or so in front. Uh, mainly the communications, the vision, uh, they had no right way to see to communicate. That's what the officers did. So Patton, who was relatively tall for this age, about six feet tall, six one, uh, had a hard time squeezing into these tanks. So he tended to ride on top of them. He's a cavalry officer. It's what you, what you do. Um, and what's going to happen within the first three hours, <clears throat> Patton will find a, a hundred or so infantrymen that have kind of their units have been lost. They're all mixed and mashed. <clears throat> and Patton is the senior officer in charge. Uh, what he does is he tells them to basically, you know, let's go, come with me. Um, and also, too, this is where he uh, helps the soldiers dig trenches. And he gets so angry with one, he hits one over the head and he writes, I think I killed one man when I hit him so hard with a shovel. Uh, so you, you will see uh, this in, in World War II, it's not the first time Patton's going to hit a soldier. Um, what's going to happen is the way Patton and most tank commanders train their uh, soldiers was when your tank breaks down, or runs out of gas or doesn't, it stops working, you grab your rifle and you go and meet the enemy. Um, and as we know, tankers not, don't really make the best infantrymen, and that's what will happen. So he takes this hodgepodge mix of, of, mix of all these tankers and infantry and leads them right into a German ambush where Patton is fairly immediately shot and wounded. Um, and this, too, if you read, it's fairly comical. <clears throat> uh, he looks up to the heavens and he's in a foxhole and he sees all his ancestors looking up above uh, that were killed in the American Civil War. And he, you know, has this conversation with them. Um, it, it, to me, I find it partially amusing. Uh, and Patton will basically pass out. Um, it is a, not to make light of it, he is shot in the leg and it exit out, it exit outs his butt. So not the most noble injury. 
Um, but Patton, it is a real injury. Um, he is littered out. Um, his life was never in danger, uh, but he does lose consciousness. And then he wakes up, he's in a field hospital and he's kind of, the first thing he wants to know is how the tank's doing. <clears throat> what happens is when Patton gets taken out, uh, Sereno Brett takes over and will lead the tanks the entire operation almost a month long. Uh, Patton is going to stay in the hospital for a while. Um, the, his infection, his wound never heals, right? Takes a while. And again, he will start yelling at uh, the medical corps officers and, and, and staff there. Uh, but it's a slow, slow heal, a lot of infections. Um, he does also get um, a few illnesses here. And this is too in an era where the uh, Spanish flu is beginning to really take a toll. Uh, but he, he begins to recover. He's writing letters within a day. I mean, he's, he's writing tons of letters. Got enough, nothing else really to do. Um, the tanks, by all their higher headquarters, receive good praise. Uh, Patton's happy with it. Um, Patton does not get a Medal of Honor. He will actually try to he, he campaign for one. Uh, but instead, he'll get a Distinguished Service Cross uh, for his wounding. <clears throat> and it, it's well-deserved. Um, his wife will write to him on, in, when he's in the hospital, Georgie, you are the fulfill fulfillment of all the ideals of manliness and high courage and bravery I've always held for you. And I've expected more of you than anyone else in the world ever has or will. Uh, so it's a pretty nice letter. Uh, from his wife and if you read the book there's more letters from Pat, uh, Patton to his wife um, where he tells her I hope you're not getting older dye your hair things like that um, so yeah he's probably not you don't want to take a uh, husband advice from sometimes um, but as Patton's healing the war ends and for Patton this is not a real happy day um, he's quite sullen about it he will write uh, in his diary a very brief line. Peace was signed. Everyone was excited. Many flags got rid of my bandage. That's it. That's all he says. Um, he will write later on uh, that you know he he was he was hoping that the war would continue. Um, and I think this is something good for uh, the public and students. You know, when the armistice is agreed to, we the kind of the narrative is the war was over. Um, what you see in Patton's letters to his fellow officers, others, you know, the war, they were, they fully expected to fight a little bit more. Patton really wanted to fight a little bit more uh, so he could get that star, maybe that Medal of Honor. <clears throat> but overall, his tank from uh, 26 September to November 10th, 1918, uh, this is some of their, their stats, two Medal of Honor winners, 13 Distinguished Service Cross Two officers killed, 21 wounded, 16 enlisted killed, 131 wounded, about 171 casualties. Um, Patton will stay on in command. Um, and because he was, again, he felt duty bound, he stays in France until March 1919. Um, and he will stay in the tank corps until 1920. Uh, so a little bit longer, um, what's going to happen is he's going to be assigned to Fort Meade, which uh, after the war, which is where they will get uh, a lot of Patton and his staff will write a lot of the first tank regulations, drill manuals, things like that. Uh, he will give up command on April 1919 and return to the cavalry on 27 August 1920. Um, he was actually demoted back to captain, but because of his connections in uh, war service, he uh, was promoted to major the next day. He's actually pretty lucky. <clears throat> um, so he went, his war rank was colonel, uh, goes back uh, to his pre-war rank. Um, and that's where he will spend really the major, the 04, 05, 06, really until the late 30s. Um, and that's when the, the, the buildup for World War II uh, begins uh, when he's involved Louisiana, Carolina maneuvers. Um, and then in closing, because I went over a little more than I intended to, um, Patton overall was very proud of his service. Um, he thought he did a good job. 
uh, and writes immediately after the war ends, now that I, he thinks he could command a division. And he writes, things really are easier than they appear. Um, and some of his lessons are that the lack of discipline in war means death or defeat. <clears throat> and that this attention to detail, which he will carry on even further, uh, you will see. You will also see, too, his, his uh, soldiers write pay articles uh, about him. Um, and one by one of his junior officers, Lieutenant Julian Morrison, who survives the war. He said, this is what he wrote. Patton made us <clears throat> understand that the tank officer was meant to die. His favorite message to his officers were, go forward, go forward. If your tank break down, if your tank breaks down, go forward with the infantry. There will be no excuse for your failure. Um, and you will see this in the, I think if you've seen the movie Patton, they make it pretty clear. Uh, they probably paint him as this overly aggressive guy, which he was not. Um, his staff in World War II was much better uh, than historians give him credit for. Uh, also, too, if you if you see what, what happens at the Battle of the Bulge, it's his staff and Patton that kind of saved the day there. <clears throat> but what I did find uh, telling, there was some dark clouds on the horizon for Patton. Um, this was going to happen in 1945. He will be relieved for command basically for angering everyone and his, for, his former best friend, Dwight Eisenhower. Um, and I think when, you know, towards the end of research, I found an interesting letter from his father to George Patton. This is dated February 20th, 1919. And what his father writes to then his son, Colonel Patton, he goes, among other things I'd worry about you is your gift of gab you have developed. It might get you in trouble. Unless restrained, such a gift is dangerous, and the temptation to say smart or striking things is hard to resist. Because you're now 34 and a colonel, and the dignity with the rank you invest with what you say. Another gift I, you have developed, I regret, is your ability to write verse upon vulgar and smutty subjects. This is dangerous. The very men to whom you read and recite stuff as your last one will laugh and apparently enjoy, but you have lowered yourself in their eyes. Above all, it lacks dignity. Um, and he goes on further and basically says, if you don't watch what you're saying, you're going to get in trouble. Um, and his dad will, uh, does not live to see George Patton emerge in World War II, uh, but what he wrote in 1919 will end up being true. Um, and that's really where the book kind of ends there. Um, maybe one day I'll get to uh, Patton in peace in the interwar period. Uh, but that if, if anybody wants to use uh, a submit a question, please <clears throat> use the question and answer icon on the screen and submit it. And between John and myself, we'll get it. Uh, we'll get it answered, or get it. I'll get it to John. Uh, I'll, I'll have a question. <clears throat> Could you talk about? Did you access the patent archives up in Massachusetts? No, uh, no, I did not. Um, I had some interaction with them years ago. So I had some things. Um, also, when Martin Blumenson, he died in 2005, he gave me a lot of stuff. Because <laughs> in some ways, I like to, I, I tell him I was this last student. Um, but I, I also was afraid, and this is, again, a, like, it's is a professional historian. I didn't want, and I had worked on a lot of stuff with Operation Enduring Freedom. You get to know some of these subjects, their family. I wanted to stay away from it. And also too, a lot of the patent stuff, his writings, it's been, it's in a lot of other archives. And I lived at that time right outside DC. Um, so that's, and I mainly did it, it was VMI, Library of Congress, and NARA too in College Park. Uh, this question comes from John. I, I haven't finished it. If, if uh, it's from John, uh, thank you for your work on the OI, uh, OEF monograph and the official history modern war on the ancient land. A history de uh, detachment commander never knows if they're asking the right questions of the right people and collecting the right documents. It was gratifying that some of the materials we collected were used. Please give your uncle. Oh, no, this is my best regards. And that serving as his command historian was a highlight for me. My question, oh, we get to the question now. And I know John. Uh, my question yep. has to do with his family political connections. His grandfather was the mayor of Los Angeles. His appointment to West Point after enrolling in VMI appears politically influenced. How important were these political connections and how do they influence his career? Oh yeah, so first, yeah, uh, 
No problem. And yes, uh, my uncle, he could not attend this. At least I don't think he was here. He uh, knows about it. It's probably for the best that he's not here. Uh, he is the uh, shortest of all Michael Shecks and now the second most famous. Um, but yeah, um, and I, a lot of my history uh, enthusiasm comes from my uncle. Uh, my dad's much more of a math science guy, um, but I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So his, I don't talk a lot in the book. It's in there because I talk about his dad. Um, Patton too. He, so his family leaves Virginia after the war, a civil war goes out to California. His family is fairly well to do. They're not millionaires like, uh, the Ayer family, uh, who George marries Patton marries into. <clears throat> um, but it, I, his political connections, you've got some of the key ones there. His grandfather and his dad were fairly well connected, um, not so much on the national level, but on the state level in California. Um, and so he did use these connections uh, to get in. The, the family legacy was to go to VMI. That's why he went there. Um, and what happened was because of Patton, again, whatever you want to believe, dyslexia, learning disability, he uh, will be a year at VMI and then will have to repeat his first year at West Point. Um, so his political connections were, in, were, were important. And in about 1916, 17, Patton will use his dad's connections to kick around the idea of getting a commission in the California Guard. Um, so that's a real thing. Yeah, his family, uh, there was some article came out about his family that said they were wealthy. They were, again, compared to Patton's wife family, they're not, but they gave him a head, it's another way gave him a head start. Uh, Patton bought a family homestead in Massachusetts uh, in the Depression era. Was that for his wife to get her back on the East Coast? Yeah, that was all, yeah. They're, uh, and his wife's money, his family, wife's family paid for that. Uh, they, he, he, a lot of their wealth was all hers. Okay. Um, so uh, this question comes from Frank. How many languages did Patton speak? Uh, so he was fairly fluent in French, uh, fairly fluent in English as well, depending on how you judge his writing. Uh, he did r speak, write a little bit of German, uh, but also too the the, uh, the the officer core of the day tended to have another language. Uh, and that was because we're still in this post-Napoleonic world. And the fact that the French were still held as the military leaders, French was his language. Uh, it's also because of his connection to his wife. His wife um, went to school there. She was a much a better French speaker. Uh, but by the time Patton leaves the war, he, he's pretty close to fluent. Um, no other languages that I, you know, that he ever, I can find, talk to. No, no Latin? Oh, I'm sure he thought he spoke Latin. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Let me see. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yep. This question is from Lee. It's a great book. I reviewed it for On Point, the Journal of Army History. Could you speak to GSP, or George Patton's relationship yep. with Hugh Drum? Yeah, um, I think I appreciate the review, too. That was good. Um, I believe, I don't know if I mentioned Drum. I do remember going through the archives. So he, Drum was a mentor to him, uh, not in the way <clears throat> others, but drum yeah i did right it was drum I'm trying to think I cannot remember like the page number it's Patton writes to drum a bit this is goes back to the california for his political connections when Patton writes he's like should i leave the act of the regular army to go to the national guard reserve side because i'll get maybe promoted i'll get into the war quicker and it's drum who says hey georgie you you got a good thing going on here be patient continue on with the act of force and you'll be taken care of. Um, so <clears throat> beyond that, I don't write, but I know drum does have an influence. Um, not it, Persian again is his main influence. Uh, drum, uh, there's a few other folks I do mention uh, in the book as well that do an in, uh, have an influence on him. And that again, because of his connections to Persian, he does get in tied into a lot of these Famous World War One interwar generals, and is is it this relationship that he developed during World War One what allowed him to stay on active duty and command uh, during World War Two? Because he was older than the the other generals in this 
Yeah, it's, and that Patton will write about that too. Um, and Carlo Deste's book gets into that. Blumenson's does too. Yeah, Patton was a slightly older. He, I think some of that's a little embellished. He was older. <clears throat> um, he is, and again, because he stays active duty um, and his, his jobs, he follows kind of the classic army combat arms officer. He becomes, you know, a three, then he gets a battalion again, then he gets a brigade. And by the time the thirties roll around, uh, he, he he's, and he always maintained good shape. That was intentional because he knew he was a couple years older than some. Uh, great, a pretty uh, good deal older than guys like Mark Clark, who was only like in the early 40s when they pinned on their four star. Um, so he was well aware of it. Um, but he, I don't think the connections had anything. He was a professional. Uh, he was at that point. Eisenhower was kind of his counterpart uh, in the tank corps. Uh, but the difference was Eisenhower was in Gettysburg, never deployed, never was in combat. And so when Patton, World War II kicks off, Patton's a logical choice uh, because he's, he, at that really, he's the only one with armor experience. Uh, here we have a, another question. He said that uh, the VMI period was very influential and that a big influence him was the brother of a successful uh, Confederate cavalry officer. Did you run into this when you did any research? Yeah, so um, the, the, fam the family connection to VMI uh, was, was a big thing with 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 Patton. He 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 uh, did read a lot. He enjoyed his family history, uh, and the all his family Pattons the uh, all I believe all of them all the they all died in the war, all for the Confederacy. Um, and he was raised in and around a lot of Confederate Civil War veterans. Um, who who told them a lot of uh, story, and I think uh, the most famous ones, Mosby, uh, Mosby's Raiders. Again, that Virginia to California connection does help off. Um, now, if you go to VMI, the room the room I was in doing research had portraits of all of Patton's uh, uncles, things like that, um, and. So he was influenced by them, particularly Mosby. Mosby was the one uh, that, you know, the, the, when Patton was just a little kid, he would put, Mosby would put him on his knee and tell him stories about the Civil War. Um, and I would think, you know, having a figure like that, one maybe the most successful Raider in the Civil War is kind of like a neighbor, had an influence on him. Um, but their, their family was a Southern genteel family, even though they were now out West. Um, so he always had a deep connection to Virginia VMI. Uh, and the reason he left VMI was it, West Point, that's, it was a direct commission to active duty. That's what he wanted. So, Anything in closing? Uh, no, I, I uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I know this will be on YouTube. So uh, if people missed it, send them the link. Um, appreciate my students coming out. Uh, and, you know, they didn't ask me my definition of war, which is one of the things we do. So that's good. I, I do think Patton um, would be very Clausewitzian in his definition of war. Um, and I do think Patton can teach a lot of modern army, a lot of military officers, um, you know, why reading and writing are important, attention to detail, um, why doing some of these small things that we all kind of get annoyed with are important. Um, and I think the big takeaway for me, look particularly from a PME side, is that this is a guy that everything he did was geared towards the next war, uh, was geared towards his profession. His hobbies were taken apart, tanks. Him and Eisenhower, when they were at Staff College, took tanks apart. They read German, French tank doctrine. Um, they were as ready as they could um, in between their you know, their, their jobs, which they had real hard jobs in the interwar period. And I think that this, that level of professionalism, that warrior ethos, that spirit um, that I think is relevant. And I think most, you know, most of my students, I think display that constantly. Um, but it's a, it's good reminder um, that also to feel great officers are important. It's not all generals. Um, so with that, um, no, if you didn't, uh, my, if, email address I can type in.
I think. If you send it to me, what I'll do is I'll post it on the um, uh, this, the YouTube channel, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's no, no problem. Uh, so people can get a hold of you, okay? Yep. So Okay, well, thanks. thanks for um, great talk. I would like to invite everybody back uh, on the 9th of November. We're going to have to Dr. William Davis. Uh, Professor Davis is going to talk about something 60 years earlier and a little bit different than our normal topic. He's going to talk romance among the ruins, the Confederate levels of General Gabriel Wharton and Nanny Ratford. Uh, a little bit out of our, uh, our normal scope, but uh, uh, he's a well-known historian of the Confederacy, and this is what he wants to talk about. So I wanted to host him, and uh, hopefully he'll join us in about two weeks. John, again, thank you very much. Uh, get back up here to the War College and the joint. That's the Jaws. I thought I'd show it off. Okay, it's the joint. It's the Joint Advanced Warfighting School. School, okay. Yep. Uh, not the big shark, but... Uh, uh, That's the mascot for now, unofficial mascot. mascot. for now, uh, but an important school, especially in the development of, of uh, future staff officers, especially in the plans area for our joint staffs. So thank you for your work there, and thanks to you for tonight. Uh, Good night. Thanks.